This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 326, session recording and update. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about the session recording initiative with Kevin Thole. Kevin is a contract front-end developer based in Chicago currently. Kevin, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us again. Thank you. I'm Nick Laughlin, and today my co-hosts are, as usual, John Picozzi. What's new with you this week? Here I am, internet friends. Uh, what's new with me? So i um, getting ready for Christmas, and this isn't a statement I'm realizing isn't going to be like a huge surprise to anybody, but... Um, you know, ordering Christmas presents online, there, there are some that have been delayed, right? And there are others that are delayed, but then get delivered very quickly. And I, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. And I'm wondering if anybody else is seeing that. Absolutely. In fact, yep. I, ha I had, I also had the reverse the other day. I had a package delivered and then I got an email two hours later saying that the tracking number had been created. <laughs> It's like, wait, I've never had that happen before. Yeah. So like um, Amazon's been doing actually pretty well, I think, at being like, hey, here's the delivery date. Oh, wait, we updated it. Now it's going to be delivered tomorrow, which I'm like, okay, cool. I don't think anybody's ever complained like, oh, you're sending me my thing early. Stop doing that. But um, I ordered a... Um, Sorry, I'm looking around because my wife's not home and uh, she doesn't listen to the show. So this will be this will be fine. Um, I ordered a Sonos speaker for her and um, they were supposed to ship it last week. And they they said, sorry, we're we're having delays. We'll ship it when we ship it and we'll let you know that we shipped it. And I was like, oh, OK, well, all right, that's cool. So it's kind of weird. It's uh, like kind of all over the place. Like I understand there's like chip shortage and, and boats in the port of uh, port of Los Angeles and whatnot, but um, it, I feel like, I feel like some things are, are still moving. Okay. And other things just aren't, but anyway. So Kevin, thank you for joining us again to talk about this. It's always great to get an update about the uh, session recording process, but what's new with you this week? Um, I'm looking forward to Friday. So all pandemic or most of pandemic, they were we all. Well, yeah, but this was this is an extra special Friday for for some of us. Uh, throughout the pandemic, a friend of ours kind of initiated this watch party, and it was every Friday night. And we'll just kind of on chat riff about the movie we're seeing, but they're only movies that are on public domain. And but you know, once things started opening up again in summer, he's like, you know, I want to go see concerts and do stuff now that we can. So we put a pause on that, but we're having a Christmas version this Friday. And I was just in my mind wishing that it, we could watch uh, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. Because I had seen this a while ago <laughs> on Riff Tracks. It's hilarious. It's the most terrible movie ever. But I didn't, when I went to first search it, it's like, oh, it's on Prime. I'm like, ah, dang it. So then I just did a search. Well, is it on public domain? Turns out it is. And so there is a link in oh, the show nice. notes for, for all you listeners because it is fantastically horrible. The premise is that Santa's sleigh gets stuck in the Florida sands. And so he falls asleep for some reason where you then watch an entirely different movie. And then he wakes up and kids help him get the sleigh unstuck. No, not really. The ice cream bunny comes, drives him to the North Pole, and then the sleigh magically teleports back. It's... okay total trash but it's fantastic and i think we're going to do a double feature with uh santa claus conquers the martians okay i have a i have a, actually, I have a question I have, a, I have so many questions so um <laughs> this movie's like you know like an hour hour and a half probably yeah for 72 1972 yeah. so okay and and well uh, so it's total garbage but what makes it great i guess is the question it's just bizarre. Like the, the, just the fact that Santa's sleigh gets caught in at, at a, basically at a beach and he can't get, I think the reindeer, it's too hot. So the reindeer abandon him and he can't <laughs> leave the sleigh. And so he goes to sleep. And while he's sleeping, you watch, uh, I think Thumbelina, an entirely different movie, but like then his sleeping, uh -huh. 
is telepathic and so kids come to join him and he's rescued by and literally someone wearing a bunny suit it is so terrible and but he's the ice cream bunny it's like what is actually happening here but the first time i saw it hmm. it was a riff tracks version and like we actually i think saw it in the theater because it was done live but we saw it was like a replay of the live thing um and i never really did mystery science 3000 too much as a kid so i was sort of enamored with the riff Riff, riffing on movies and just I'd never really gotten too much into B movies and that was just such a fun experience it's that sort of kind of kicked off my my different my level set of what joy a level a good B movie brings versus in in the past I'd be like I don't want to waste my time on that I want you know high quality good entertainment yeah, where this is. is low quality fantastic entertainment because you you laugh at the stupidity of the lines the the scenarios it's all just like huh. in the okay. hopefully what yeah. we'll get to like santa claus conquering martians like come on yeah there, there's <laughs> there's good bad and there's bad bad uh yeah and bad bad is is not a thing i want to participate in because i've seen bad bad yeah. movies and it's like okay forget it so or, you're, or you're... high quality entertainment that is also bad like sharknado okay. If you're like an avid yeah. avid movie watcher, this may not be the the film for you. But if you're into I, yeah, like looking at like like, hey, this movie's really bad, and we're gonna watch it because it's really bad. Um, I'm looking at IMDb right now, and they get they give it a 1.3 out of 10 stars. So <laughs> sounds um, about right. <laughs> let that gauge your um, your viewing or non viewing of of this. Right. Apparently, there's I two mean, versions what, what, too because. You either see Thumbelina as the movie within a movie or Tom Thumb. But also there's Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn <laughs> in this movie. It's, it's just... I mean, the, the thing I love about these kinds of movies sometimes, it, it really takes me, it breaks the fourth wall just thinking about what the actor was thinking as they were going through. Like sometimes you see great performance, like how did they do that? But then you think like, what was the guy in the bunny suit thinking about his right. prospects like if i and, and someone early, and someone paid money to noticed. have this produced <laughs> like they paid money yeah, for I, this I, I i love those kind of movies um, all-time favorite for me is velocipaster look it up it's on prime a movie yeah, that was resulted as an autocorrect failure <laughs> truth well that's still that's still uh that's still have you seen velocipaster 2 they haven't made one Though they are creating, they're supposed to create a like a extended universe type tie-in type thing. I don't want to go so far as to call it an extended universe. I mean, the upside here is this is a 5.1 out of 10 stars. It's fantastic. Fantastically horrible, but hilarious. A lot After... of opportunities for, you know, drinking games if you participate in that. And water is a drink. After losing his parents, a priest travels to China where he inherits a mysterious ability that allows him to turn into a dinosaur. At first <laughs> horrified by the new power, uh, uh, yeah, somebody convinces him <laughs> to use it to fight crime and ninjas. Everything's better when you add and ninjas. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to check those movies out. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so for me this week, nothing, nothing super exciting either. Uh, I spent the last couple of days rearranging my desk, trying to clean up a little bit, freshen up. So uh, I moved my microphone. So it's a, it's a shotgun mic. So it's supposed to be able to be a little bit further away, clear the desk. But I finally uh, spent the time to do some cable management, and it's now uh, about an arm's length away, which is what it's supposed to be. Uh, whereas previously it was kind of covering half the desk. Uh, so it feels a lot cleaner and and I'm looking forward to a much, little bit more space. We also have a short promotion here for the Florida Drupal Camp. It's coming up in the next, uh, in, in a short while. So if you're looking forward to getting back together with some other Drupal people, uh, it's a three-day conference coming up and give this a listen. Hi, this is Mike Herschel with Florida Drupal Camp, and holy cow, the Florida Drupal Camp site just launched. With me, I have Adam. Hey, Adam. 
Hello. Adam Barn and Amy June Highline, the Aaron Winborn Award winner. How's it going? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Adam, what are the dates for Florida Drupal Camp? It is February 18th through the 20th, 2022 in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Ooh, do you know what the average temperature is in Orlando that time of year? I believe it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. You are correct. Amy June, can you give us an overview of how many days this conference is? It is a three-day conference. Friday is trainings, half and full day. Uh, Saturday is a full day of sessions, and Sunday is sessions and contributions. We have a brand new website, Rockin' Drupal 9, with brand new theme. It's at fldrupal.camp. And everyone who's listening is invited to this. And uh, hey, Adam, are, are we going to have an alligator at the camp, like for real? We are. We're going to have an actual alligator that you can pet and see and get your picture taken <laughs> with. And, and he probably will not bite you, probably. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a maybe. But, but we're seriously going to have an alligator at the camp. And uh, so check out the camp. Session submissions are open. Uh, sponsorships are open. Uh, we have uh, two of our three featured speakers announced. And yeah, so fldrupal.camp, uh, February 18th through 20th, 2022 in beautiful Orlando, Florida. And we're in person. Holy cow. Woo. I know, right? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, uh, Adam, Mike, and Amy June for helping record that promotion. And uh, looking forward to hearing what comes out of Florida Drupal Camp. We also have a module of the week this week. The module of the week is CSP, uh, not CSV, uh, as uh, patrons may have heard us mention before the show. Uh, but the CSP module, I think I've mentioned on the show before, but it's never module of the week. It is a module that helps you with the content security policy headers. Um, if you don't know what the CSP headers are, they're a way to block third party uh, URLs essentially from executing on your site. So it helps you get pretty tight control over what's displayed, everything from style sheets to JavaScript to images. Um, so there are a lot of options and this just gives you a really nice interface for, uh, for updating those. It's also great for letting you pull your hair out when, uh, things stop working or don't work because the policy is, has to be updated and you don't know why something doesn't work. It's like, oh, right. The content policy. Is there I've got, a I've got feelings about this module. <laughs> is there like a, a, a browser pop-up or a browser like does no. something go in go nope. into like the log that says like hey you violated nope. the policy that's why nope. this doesn't work you have to check your you have to inspect your browser and look at your why your javascript's failing and oh right no there, there's a uh is there so it, it will it, it will throw a console error when content is blocked but it also does post in the drupal um log uh okay. i think that there's there's an option you have to set, but the problem is twofold. One, and this isn't the problem with the module. The module is fantastic. This is a, a problem with- Agreed, it's, in it's doing its job. Yeah. Problem one is if there are some things that you do get included on your site because of some, some third-party app is pulling it in and you don't want them to execute. So you have something that you're trying to block that will flood your logs. So it's very hard to find if you're if something new is being blocked that shouldn't be blocked. Sometimes it can be difficult to find that one because there's just so much white noise. Uh, the second thing is, even if you don't have a lot of things blocked, it sometimes takes a little bit of detective work to find out what is the final configuration because you might be blocking a script, so you unblock that script, which then allows an image to load. So then you have to unblock the image, which then allows something else to happen. So you sometimes have to update it a few times to find out, okay, I need to add these four things in order to get this to work. Uh, so it does, CSPs themselves take a little bit of, of work to get them configured right. But the module itself is fantastic. It really uh, solves an issue because if a client needs CSP headers, then this is definitely the way to go. 
just be prepared for a lot of maintenance um, and a lot of questions why things aren't working once you implement CSPs. So let's move on to our primary topic for this week. So, uh, you know, for listeners who haven't listened to the previous show on recording Drupal events, Kevin, can you give us a, a brief history of how you get started recording Drupal Drupal camps? Yeah. Uh, so in my job at the time, my my full time job at the time, we ran an event marketing conference, and so we hired an AV company, but they were really expensive. So we used them for the keynotes and then all the breakout sessions. We did sort of a homegrown solution where we would have a video recorder in the back, just watching slides change and we would get their audio. And then I'd have to rebuild uh, the presentation as if it were like a webinar. Um, so I had that kind of in my back pocket. And uh, in, in 2013, uh, I was, uh, lead organizer for a new Drupal camp in the Chicago suburbs, Drupal Camp Fox Valley. And so okay. at the time, nobody was recording camps because it was too hard. And it's like, wait, I know exactly what to do here. So we set it up the way that I did it for my work event, except tech talks are very different than marketing talks, where maybe you've got 20 slides in an hour, where I remember one talk, there were... I think 119 slides in an hour. So the amount of effort okay. wow. that it took to rebuild, to use that same process was enormous, uh, but still worth it. Um, Cause it was important to me to, to, to figure this out. Um, and that's where it all started. And for our listeners, that was episode 146. If you want to go back and listen to the first time that we spoke with Kevin uh, about this. Uh, it was four or five years ago, so there's been quite a few quite a few changes. Uh, quick quick question to before kind of a pre pandemic about how many camps were you recording each year? Uh, the busiest year was what 2018. I did 15 in person recordings, and I think three oh, wow. what I call proxy recordings, where I send the equipment. Or I think that year I also helped purchase and deliver equipment to mountain camp where they, the intent was for them to, I buy it, prep it, ship it, and they keep it. So once they learn how to use hmm. it, they can do it themselves. Oh, wow. That's yeah. In, in the beginning, it was, I think three or four camps at the very beginning. Oh, wow. And then suddenly it exploded because of Slack uh, and, and a friend of mine who was running Texas camp. And she's like, Hey, have you heard of Kevin, everybody? Because it was the Drupal organizer Slack just started. She's like, hey, he can do this stuff. Because otherwise, it was, it, I had started just through Twitter. I'm like, hey, you know, sponsor my travel and I will record your event. Hmm. So you, you've, you've been everywhere. I mean, you've seen, seen all, sorts of, all, all sorts of camps, right? Yeah, I've done 23 different individual camps, four of which I've never actually attended. So four were only ever by proxy. I also even recorded... Uh, DrupalCon Amsterdam, which was a huge win for me because hmm. everybody always thought, oh, you're doing this, you're doing DrupalCon. And we actually talked. So after the, after the, again, I guess a bit of history, after like that first attempt, which was terrible, we then for the first year of MidCamp, which was like a couple months after that, we were able to get the Drupal Accord, the Drupal Association's um, giant Pelicate Pelican case of laptops, which I don't know if they still do this, but at the time, if your event was outside of their shipping windows for North American and European cons, they would just loan you the equipment. But you got a case full of really? laptops you had to wipe. So there was uh, tons of setup. The, it was very complicated. They didn't work terribly well. They were doing these things where they would drop a frame every now and then. So like I'd have to go and edit out these little blue screens. So I was still doing a ton of post-processing and it was just, it was not user-friendly to say the least. And then you're, you're exhausted, your event's over. Now you've got this body-sized Pelican case. You have to go find a FedEx store on Sunday afternoon to get rid of it. Um, so 
that's when I started figuring out, well, what's a better solution? And we had talked to the folks running the recording at DrupalCon Austin. And because I had some ideas and I, I think I had already done a first test of the new, what is now basically the early version of the current kit. And um, their biggest issue was you can't remote start, stop or monitor it. You have to, and once it's recording, you hope it's working. It's generally working, but there's no way to actually monitor. And their, their key is if we can't monitor and because they set up like this huge war room where they see everything and so yeah that was a that was a non-starter in their opinion for a, a con but i proved them wrong with oh, amsterdam wow. <laughs> that was that was painful painful but uh, rewarding so I, I think it's fair to say you have tons of tons of recording experience both at the camp level and the con level right so um let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the session recording uh, initiative and you know what is it yeah so while i was getting started i was getting money from events going into my bank account that i was keeping track of all the receipts because they're all reimbursements so not actual expenses but i'm like this is sketchy you know tax wise but also i wanted this you know companies and camps are giving me in faith their money and I wanted public accounting of what I was doing so I had and I think I don't know there's I had a public uh, google doc just kind of here's the money in here's the money out here's why but it was not great and uh, open and so a I wanted to step that up but I also wanted to actually formalize this and make it bigger it's like you know it was just me doing it I can't just do this by myself for all of time. And I just wanted to kind of create a roadmap. And so I did that. And um, one of the items was, uh, well, I guess, I don't know, getting in the weeds of it. But yeah, the, the initiative is there's public money and I charge now a fixed fee per event, depending on what it is. Like, and the intent is rather than just reimbursing my air and lodging, it's enough money so that I can use any extra funds for equipment maintenance, new purchases, even reimburse my, you know, meals and stuff within what's reasonable for business travel, ultimately get a fund so that other people can get involved and I can reimburse their expenses, ideally pay a livable wage during events because this is hard work. Um, so that's that's the idea around the initiative, and it's it's now all funded on or the money handling is through Open Collective, so it is public accounting. Okay. So, so you said something you said something interesting and and I think important there, right? Not the, for you to do this, right? So so if I'm hearing you correctly, the the reason to create the the session recording initiative was sustainability, transparency, and and to be able to you know to be able to further further this effort. Um, but yep. ye, also something important that you said there was that um, you weren't necessarily being paid by your employer to go record all of these no. games, right? No, no, no. So you were either you were either, um, you know, taking unpaid leave or taking vacation time or something. So part of it is making sure that you were compensated for your for your time in some of these cases, right? Yeah, uh, and I still don't do that for myself. Um, and it was in the beginning, I started as, you know, yeah, PTO. And then uh, I was fortunate enough that where I worked, because it was, it was part-time marketing, part-time, uh, web and digital for our company. And so the knowledge I was bringing back, my supervisor was kind enough to realize that even though you're out of the office, you're still bringing back new principles. We even, we didn't use Drupal at the time, but we used it for a small project, um, refactoring code, all the stuff I've learned about CSS. She's like, you're bringing knowledge back. So you can treat these as work, you know, work from home days, basically. So that really opened it up for me to be able to, because I was basically using all of my PTO just for recording. But yeah, once I, uh, the company got bought, I got laid off and now I'm solo. And now I don't get 
I don't earn money on the days that I'm traveling or going to camp and that's, I'm able to do it. That's not, I'm in a position where I'm able to do it. Not everybody can do it. And that's why I want to get to a point where we can have kind of local pods of people who know how to use the equipment. And then I can pay them a, a, an hourly wage that's comparable to what someone, I don't know, still trying to figure out how, what the model is for paying and then also how to get in the weeds of 1099s and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think I, my opinion is whether it's you or somebody else, you should be paid for that. You're bringing, this is extreme value that you're bringing. And when you look at it, both, both in value and like the service that you're providing, but also in the cost that you're charging, because when you're looking at recording events from a professional company, oh yeah, you know, there's the quality of your product is just as good, and the cost there is many, many, many times. I I, I laugh charging. at certain events who um, pay a lot of money, and their their videos are not posted for like four to six weeks, and mine are generally up before the event's over. Well, here's my dilemma, right? camps don't have a whole lot of money so to and i, I it's a flat thousand dollars commit you know unless you really need generally up to five rooms if you need more than that then maybe i've got to ship or have more expenses so maybe like when i went to london it was 1500 um because airfare was nearly the thousand i would charge um so that's that's one consideration is like if I, I could overprice, I could price it such that camps can't afford it. Um, and then also this, as far as payment, like this was big for me to be like, I don't contribute modules. I don't maintain code. Mm -hmm. I use it all. So this was my, this was my contribution back. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, and I think for me, that's always going to be the case. Um, granted, it's a harder sell to bring people on. So that's why I want to create some sort of system where you can yeah there's a, i want to give incentive for people to to get involved yeah so I, my, my point was going to be that you know i think the session recording initiative you know we've talked about what it is but i think i think from a camp organizer standpoint you know it's important it, it's important and it serves a great purpose and it's a great it's a great service i mean for new england drupal camp we've had you uh come out and record um almost all or pretty close more than more than uh the um years that we haven't had you come out right so you, you've come out for for a few years and it's it's you know it's a flat fee you come out you record the recordings are great you post them before in most cases as you said before the event is even over so i think you know from a camp organizer standpoint it's it's a super super important super valuable service and you know uh, you know, it's exciting to see to see you kind of pushing it forward. Yeah, and I, I was and it's, also it's easy. A, it is easy for for from it's got to be it's got to be perspective easy. and an, oh yeah okay from speaker perspective and from an organized perspective it's easy, um, which is which is also one of those big wins. Like for you just have to remember to tell the speaker push that button mm -hmm. and make sure the light is I don't remember the color. Green. Whatever, it's, or it's red. It's green. red. Make sure the light. Like, yeah, yeah, make sure it's red, and then you're good. Um, and what well, it's blue when it's not recording. I think it's red when, but or it's anyway, green when it's those... green when it's ready. Red when it's recording. Okay, so you but you have all those instructions right now, and like I do, said, yes. like having that process down, you know, makes it very easy. Like we know we're we're going to get a good quality recording from it. Um, yeah, and and in terms of like raising, you know, the the idea that professional companies charge more. It's like, I'm not a professional company, so I'll do the best I can. Like, I'm not guaranteeing anything. Like other, some, I think companies yeah. have guarantees where I aim for a hundred percent and I keep track and it like hurts me when I don't get it, but that's, you know, that's I think from, money. from a camp, from a camp level though, like that's, it's reasonable, right? You're, you're offering a reasonable service for a reasonable fee. Yeah. And, and the result is like, Hey, if somebody doesn't push the button or something goes wrong with the device or like, you know, there, there's any list of things that could go wrong. Right. Yeah. So we, we might miss a video. We might miss two videos. Like, yeah. 
it's, you know, it's acceptable for at least from, from a camp organizer standpoint, I think it's acceptable and it's easy on both of the speaker yeah. side and the organization side. Like once Ke once Kevin or whoever is, is, you know, representing the session recording initiative is like assigned to your event. Like you're like, okay, I don't have to worry about that now. Like it's taken care of. Right. Yeah. I'm checking it off the list. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's, it's, it's great. So you'd mentioned this a couple of times and I may have as well. Can you tell us what, what is the kit? Yeah. So the kit is actually, um, it's a recording device. Uh, hop hog, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, HD PVR rocket. I should know this, but it's been so many years since I've actually touched the equipment at this point or months. I don't know. Um, it's inexpensive. It's about $180 for the unit, but it's intent. It's, it's original intent is to sit between your Xbox or PlayStation and the TV and do pass through recording of video gameplay, which is why it's not streaming. So it has to record to a thumb drive. And then also it's got an audio in. So that way, if you are doing its intended purpose, you can do commentary while you're playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, but because it has that standalone ability, which a lot of these units don't, um, it means no software. So you don't like a lot of, a lot of the solutions are, well, use Camtasia or whatever. Well, you have to install software on a laptop, which a lot of people can't, especially like an iPad, um, which I've recorded sessions off of iPads. Um, yeah, so it's device agnostic, it's standalone, and it's yeah, pass through recording uh, HD quality video. So, so that's the recording. And then in terms of a microphone, I'm using a Zoom H2N, which is great at just, it's inexpensive, it records to, but it, it acts as the mic into the, the video recorder, but it also took me a while to figure out to do this, but I can also then stick a, SD card in there and get a backup audio recording. So if I, so that's turns out to be a crucial backup. I it also has batteries in case power gets cut. Uh, so you can still get audio even if the laptop dies. Um, and then the associated dongles to both connect the unit pieces to itself and also deal with any flavor of input and every flavor of output. So just to just to kind of top high level, right, this, right, you're basically sitting in between the projector and the microphone to the audience and the presenter, right? So yeah, you, you, the projector and the microphone to the audience go into your device and then super easy for the presenter, they just have a, a HDMI cable with a dongle that they plug into their laptop and that that takes care of it. Yep. Yeah. And I never like, I have the ability to plug into room audio, but I never do that. Cause if something fails there, like I always want to be independent of everything. Right. And have backup. I, I've took me a while to get there, but I've got redundancy too. So what version is this kit? Cause it sounds like you've kind of rotated a few. I, I would call it version two iteration 20. Like, Ultimately, it was the first thing that, like what I call the manual recording that didn't work. So this was, I pretty much got it right out of the gate, um, at least with the recording device, but it, it comes with little lav mics. So we used those lav mics the first time we tried it. And that was problematic, you know, for co-presenters or it's all this, you know, it just, and it, you know, it didn't work. So just, Basically, the, the troubleshooting of using it throughout the, the number of events has kind of bolstered the ability of it to be almost bulletproof. Yeah, and from, from a speaker perspective, it's, there's a big red button you have to push, at least it's my recollection. Yes. You plug, as John said, you plug in your laptop to the appropriate dongle, and then you push a big red button. And then at the end, you push a big red button again, and that's it. Uh, and when it, when it when it works, that is that is the case. Yes. Do you still ship the kits? Uh, I do. I've got uh, I got like what thirteen 
13 hole kits. So I kind of keep five on reserve for in person and then five for shipping around. And like oh, uh, three ish, there were about three ish events each year that would take me up Pacific Northwest. I always ship to them. Baltimore, I always ship to them because it generally because of conflicts. Um, Nerd Summit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. Right. Where do you store these? I mean, they're not, they're not huge, they're, but they're not They're tiny. not huge. I store them in, in the Pelican case. I, or I, I've got like, I had a, what, like a shelf in, in my last apartment. Now it's in a dresser. Yeah. They, they, okay. they get, take up surprisingly little, surprisingly little space. Okay. It's the cases that take up most of the space. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I think this is probably a question on everybody's mind, right? Uh, over the past couple of years, we've been doing way less uh, in-person events or almost no in-person events. Um, how has the pandemic helped or, or hurt, you know, the session recording initiative? Uh, I pretty much put it, it, it stopped in its tracks, I think is the safest way to say it. I did do a couple... Uh, post-processing requests. So like I would, uh, what it was, uh, I don't know, Philadelphia, Drupaladelphia, but they've renamed. Uh, they used, I forget what service, but they want to know if I could download and process and upload all the videos. So I said, sure, you know. So for those, I said, you know, donate what you think you want. Um, and there were a couple of other events where I just basically did post-processing of whatever the service spits out. Cause there's, yeah, I think, I think there's kind of no need, there's no need. Yeah, I think that's one of the big changes that we we did. Cause our, our virtual camps have been on Zoom. Yep. Which you can record, but because we've been doing BOFCONs, we, we wanted people to feel comfortable to speak up and we didn't want them to be recorded. So we, uh, we decided not to record anything except for the keynotes. Yeah, in the camp we did a little... sort of a hybrid type. We did boffs and sessions. So, okay. but uh, that was all. I think that was all Zoom too. I've de I've dealt with Zoom videos. Again, I forget what Drupaladelphia used, I th and I th maybe even Hopin's videos. Is that so? Is that something that if if somebody were interested in? you know, hiring you or the session recording initiative to kind of edit Zoom videos and get them up on YouTube either during or after an event? Is that something that that would interest the, the initiative? Yeah, and I've done it. Um, it's certainly a little le less glamorous because, um, again, part of this was to also build my network and, and spread the word about what this, what this what's how this process works. And that's all sort of obfuscated through this, but it's still, it's still a service that if people need it, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Um, it's definitely more work. It turns out to a process videos from these services than it is when I do it. So that's ironic, <laughs> but <laughs> I've got, I've done, I have enough video editing experience over the years that it's still quick enough. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the pipeline? Um, I, and and I'm asking kind of two two parts of that question. One is like, what's the whole pipeline? If a camp is thinking about utilizing the session or uh, or engaging with the session recording initiative, what does that look like at a high level? But I'm also curious, kind of at a more detailed level, like the the editing workflow, like what, what that looks like as well. Uh, so let's start with the global. If if a new camp or an existing camp is thinking about recording sessions and had done it previously. What does that pipeline look like? Um, generally get in touch with me. Um, it usually happens through Twitter or Slack and then make a donation depending on what is needed at the uh, Open Collective. And then once those things happen, well, of course, and then checking my schedule, um, then it's pretty much a go. And in terms of, I guess you want to then know the next steps. So yeah, like, like uh, so you, when do you show up to the camp? What, how, what's that up like? Uh, you know, what, what does the process look like from a session or uh, 
camp organizer perspective? Yeah, so I'll be in touch with the event kind of leading up to it. I try to get there. Like uh, I generally, it depends on the format of the event. If there's training day, I try to arrive on training day because those are generally not recorded, though I will ask. Um, so I'm always there the day before session set up. And then if I can get access okay. to the venue the day before, great. Means I have a less stressful morning. But if not, mm -hmm. I get there early and do the best I can. And I've gotten to the point where it takes me maybe 10 minutes per room to set up. And the first one's always the toughest because every venue is different. So it's like, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know anything walking in usually. Um, sometimes events can get me the details, but it's still until I'm there and actually yep. hooking up the equipment, it doesn't matter. Because also there's cable management and taping down the equipment. So is it a podium? Is it a desk? Is it a pile of toothpicks? Like yeah. I haven't seen that, but some venues are interesting to deal with. Um, yeah, remember, so setup you, takes you place. Basically, need space. You need space and power. You know, and yep. you, you need to have enough space that people can put their laptops still or yep. whatever device they're using. And I do try to tape the instructions nearby. That is, that is also, and again, it's been so long, but I do request power at every podium because I've got two plugs that I need um, access to. And so, and a lot of times you get there in the morning, so well, there's no power at the podium. So now I can't set up, I'm delayed. So I'm gonna stage everything and then come back around. So it's the morning of, or even the night before, there's a good hour, hour and a half of running around like crazy to get to remember, it all set up. I seem to remember one of our first years uh, of recording uh, New England Drupal Camp having that, that problem. Like, yes, there's power at the podium and you being like, well, there's one plug and I need two. And we took care of it. It was fine. Yeah. We got, we or, got, we got surge protectors and everybody was happy, but yeah. Or like Florida, yeah. we've, we've got power, but no HDMI. It's like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's still mind blowing to me. Like an hour to an hour and a half of setup to record five rooms, mostly flawlessly. Like it, it's, well, I, I, I mean, it definitely took longer in the beginning during the event. Um, essentially, if I've got volunteers, great. I've sort of stopped asking for volunteers and started asking for dedicated people because in the early days, it's like, oh yeah, you've got room monitors, you've got volunteers, but I never know who those people are. So I was basically then stepping on people's toes because if I don't know who that person is and I haven't had time to explain yeah. the process to them, I don't, I don't know if they're doing their job. And early on, like even camp organizers at Fox Valley, the one of the first ones like, oh, can you cover this room? So like, and they, and you get a yes, and this is a camp organizer. And so you, you take care of the rooms that you were supposed to take care of. You take a little stroll and you see like, oh, they're not recording. He's like, oh, I totally forgot. It's like, no, because yeah, part of the, during the event is go to every room, make sure you negotiate the connection between laptop and device for every speaker kind of reiterate the process to the speakers, hit the button, stop the button. If it, if it dies in the middle, restart the button. Um, and then go through and after session start, make sure everybody's actually recording. So I do set all the equipment if I can, line of sight to the door so I can see that red recording light is, is on. Otherwise I have to go into the room and check because I will. Uh, and then, after the sessions, make sure everybody's done a clean stop. So it's yeah. just uh, 15 minutes of frenetic activity and then like an hour, half hour waiting and then rinse and repeat. I, I think one of the advantages of doing this in so many camps now too is that a lot of attendees keep an eye on the button too. Like I've been in rooms where like before you even start, one of the other attendees is like, don't forget to hit the button. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's fantastic. And some people. It, yeah, it's it's becoming crowdsourced, um, and I, yeah. like I I credit Mike Herschel for taking a picture of me at, of me at Gun, GovCon. He's like, point that way. I'm like, okay, and then he created a slide of me basically pressing the button, and so he created uh -huh. a, a slide bef right after, right before his title slide or after, you know, and so then speakers start putting it in their notes, 
or adding slides. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's comical and touching that, you know, people are going that extra step. Hmm. Cool. And then in addition to, and then typically at lunch or coffee breaks, I will swap out the media. So both the SD card okay. and the audio unit and the thumb drive in the screen recorder. So that way I can start processing videos and then see if there's any issues. Like for example, there was a, a unit at DrupalCon Amsterdam that was recording over each past recording. Cause like the thumb drives can hold easily a whole day of recording, but if it's rewriting that file name, well, yeah. you've just lost it. You're losing the data. Yeah. So to hmm. be able to kind of figure that out early on, or there's times that well, I didn't, I didn't turn on the the power to the audio, or I didn't plug in the audio. So it's like, why are there no why is there yeah. no audio for this room? It's like, oh, because you're a dummy, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And and what does that editing process look like? for for a particular session or a particular i guess room because you you take them one room at a time right yeah one room at a time um it's generally if all goes well i should have you know individual like if it, if there were two sessions between morning and lunch i should have two two video files on each thumb drive and so i'll i'll just kind of do a quick um quick pass on you know is it a clean start is it a clean stop and then are there any audio issues that i'll just kind of like skim through and then if that's the case they're ready to go because they're already the device already spits out compressed video so i can already upload it um oh, okay. there are some times where there's a false start or they went on they left it on too long so then that's just a quick trim i use final cut um just because that's what I learned at work. Um, and then I have to export and compress. So then that adds just processing time, but not me time. And then there's times where there were either known problems or uh, PCs are always the thorn in my side because audio doesn't always record. So then I have to then match okay. the audio to the presentation. Okay. But those are definitely the audio from the back. You mean? The, audio the backup audio. Zoom to the... Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's always and fun, like because it's not recording, so you have to kind of do it by ear by seeing the slides, right? In guess. Yeah, you, it can take. Oh. It can be challenging, especially the hardest one was. Uh, it was either uh, yeah, it was Mount or uh, Drupal North, where they encourage, or no Drupal, I don't know one of one of the Canadian ones. So I had a presentation all in French. And it, I had to match the audio to the slides. <laughs> that took me a minute. <laughs> I think the joke there is that you're not a native French speaker, right? That is correct. Do you speak any French at all? Uh, Allons-y. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and we, so no, I think no is French. <laughs> there you have it. Huh. Interesting. So, so Kevin, not to harp on harp on the pandemic, but um, I'm sure you had you had things you know, planned for the initiative um, before the pandemic started, and I'm and I'm wondering what those plans might have been, and then also um, wondering now as we're kind of hopefully approaching the end to the pandemic, like what the future looks like for the for the initiative. Yeah. Uh... There, it, it was 2020 was supposed to be an interesting year. Um, I had just done DrupalCon Amsterdam and made a lot of connections in Amsterdam because this was sort of the first time, like I have the 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 U.S. covered North America basically. Like I I, I pretty much either record all the camps or have contacts with all the camps, but overseas is like they're not out of the U S was sort of my next focus. Uh, so being able to, to talk to people and show in action, what's happening for people who run events, not in the U S was, was huge. And so that's where like 
sight unseen, the organizers from London are like, I don't care what it costs. We're bringing you here. You're recording our event in March. And I'm like, well, mid camps the following week. So in addition um, to, to London, I was in the talks with people that organized from troop camp Kiev, um, Spain, Serbia, Iceland. So I was going to start even possibly recording DrupalCon Barcelona um, since that worked so well the first time because, yeah, they were okay with it. They, 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 whatever. Um, yeah, so that it was going to be like the year, the breakout year of, of moving this overseas and then coming back from Drupal Camp London, like it all shut down. I was happy to even get home from London. I got COVID on my way home from London. Uh, and wow. so everything pretty much stopped. Um, and then now that, John, since you asked, now that things are starting up again, like I made a hard decision to not record Florida because they asked and I initially said yes. And then it's like, I reviewed the requirement. It's like, you're in mask all day, which I'm okay with, except I have glasses. I am very much hustling around. So the idea of being out of breath, sweating, face sweating, glasses fogged up for the entire day, I can't actually do my job. So I unfortunately, I, I said no, but I do, doesn't mean that the initiative can't do it. It's just me personally can't do it. I know um, the Chattanooga, folk, Ch Chattanooga folks, they know the equipment, they've helped me. Um, so the, I guess the next opportunity is, well, who else can jump in and do it in my stead? Who doesn't have some of the physical issues that I've gotten? Is there a, you know, is there more like obviously getting, getting recordings going again, but you know, is there more long-term vision there or is it simply just like, Hey, let's get, let's get to recording again. And then we'll, we'll start building on building on as, as we start seeing more demand. Yeah. It's, it's a little hard to say because there's a lot of talk of hybrid events. I think a hybrid event doesn't need in-person recording. Um, because you pull the videos from the service if you're streaming anyway. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's going to depend, I guess. Um, but for sure, the, the, the plan in 2020 and the plan remains is to teach people how to do this and let other people do this. I've, I've had my time to shine. I'll still organize and, and mentor, but I want to pass the torch. Makes sense. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, I guess the question for me is still, why is session recording important to you specifically? Why is this like a passion? I know you talked about using it as a, uh, you know, a, as a non-code contribution to Drupal, which, which is awesome. Like, obviously we're big, we're big fans of that, but I mean, is there another reason why it's important to you? Well, uh, that's initially how I learned Drupal. I watched, I found the videos on archive.org. Um, videos were, I can read an article, but oh. hearing the explanation somehow works better than reading an article. Um, mm -hmm. and there's not always, someone doesn't always write up an article about what they talk about at an event too. Sure. So that was for me, I figured since that's how I learned other people, like I can't be, I'm not a special snowflake. Other people are learning this way too. Um, and then the, what I didn't expect is that uh, by capturing these videos and making them available, people are telling me both the, the presenters are telling me, Hey, you're helping me build my resume because I know this is going to be recorded. I can point to this. That never occurred to me ever. And then also people would tell me you've made this event that I couldn't attend accessible to me. So the accessibility and the lower barrier to entry to, to learn this content. Again, I just, Again, I was I was really touched when when people will kind of pull me aside and tell me how it's impacting them. And I mean, I think for me that that you know that is um, one of the reasons why uh, you're an Aaron Winborn Award winner, right? Like you've put your heart and soul into this, and like the community recognizes that, and and I think we I think we value that. I mean, at least I, I know I value that. So, um, 
I think yeah, and even are... even events have said like, well, if we offer recordings, our event is more, you know, it elevates the event. And so okay. it helps, you know, it it's it really does help everybody involved. So I want to go back it, to something. It also helps well, it right also next. helps speakers because a lot of events ask speakers for oh yeah, weeks. past recordings, yep. You know, past recordings. And so <laughs> having that helps, you know, people listen to their own talks and see what they could do better next time and yep. promote themselves. So it, it, it's helpful on, on all fronts, I think. Absolutely. I want to go back and talk about something that we touched on a little bit previously. Um, and that's that's similar services that are doing what the session recording initiative is doing and the cost around those. Why do you think that similar services that are recording, you know, events and processing the video and posting them or providing them to the camp organizers, why do you think they're so much more expensive than what you are able to produce with the session recording initiative? I can only guess. Um, sure. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. Yeah. But also related to just my initial search for equipment is like, there's there's a lot of money to be made here, mm -hmm. both in equipment cost and service. And so the AV industry, it seems they're protective of that, that dollar amount that they can earn. Mm -hmm. And so, because even prosumer equipment is super expensive and not up to the task, surprisingly. So this this little gaming device is doing better than what, something three or four times the price with allegedly bells and whistles that I, this doesn't have. And still, cause I've tried some of them and it's like, I've stopped trying it because, and people will keep telling me, Oh, here's try this. And it's like, Nope, this works. I don't yeah, want to stream that, this. I don't want to don't fix yeah. it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And eventually, hopefully they never stop making these units, but eventually they're going to break. Um, who knows? But yeah, as to why, I don't know. Well, and also people, other companies are not, are not doing this as a volunteer, right? Sure. Again, this is, again, this is my volunteer contribution to an open mm -hmm. source project. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think, I think some people don't realize the cost jump in some things. Like I, earlier this year, I bought a quote unquote, nice, nicer camera. Um, and one of the features that um, I needed was a live out for HDMI, which if it, most cheap cameras don't have. And it's like one of those things where I found, I found a decent camera that has that feature. I think it was between two and $300 because it was on sale. But it's like, if you have that requirement, the next camera that had, like I found one camera in that price range that had it, the next cameras that have that are all five, six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. It's like, you, you, you have a feature like this that works for a live event. And suddenly you have to add two or three zeros to just the cost of the equipment, uh, never mind the training to use the equipment. Uh, and, and I think another big one, I, I think there's two other big things, and you kind of hinted at these. One is a lot of these companies will have guarantees of 100% coverage. And then the second thing is um, they're trying to turn a profit too. I mean, they're, they're profiting off of it. It's a business, it, it's not a volunteer. Yeah. I don't and think and I'm to... sorry. I don't. I don't care how much you charge. You can't guarantee 100. percent I was just gonna say. I was gonna say the same thing. I'd be interested to see like the companies that guarantee 100. percent What the um, what the SLA looks like there um, to to ensure that that's gonna happen, or what what the person well, gets back if it doesn't happen. I mean, my my guess is that it's similar to weddings. Like they're they have insurance that will cover having the speaker do it again, right? so that they can record it. Right. And even if it's a smaller audience, you know, they're, they're just recording it again to get the, get the pictures and get the final product. So it's, you know, no, no truth in advertising, but truth in, and, in, in and, Drupal and initiatives, the, right? <laughs> the, the other piece is kind of something you've hinted at too, Kevin, which is redundancy. Like if you have, you know, two or three recordings, the odds mm -hmm. of all of them failing. Yeah. And if you have staff that are taking those downloads every single session right away, rather than every two or three sessions, then the odds of you know three of them failing. Right. You know, it, it, 
it, it, it goes down. But when you're recording in triplicate and you have somebody in each room taking every session, those expenses add up pretty quickly. Yeah, staff hours. Uh, so got a question for you in, in this time of remote sessions and, and possibly hybrid sessions, do you have any tips or tricks for camp organizers on, on or our listeners on processing video from those different services like Zoom or, or tips on making that easier if they were to engage with the session recording initiative on how to make your life easier if they're using Zoom or something? Yeah, it's it it's tricky. It, it kind of goes down to so someone needs to just be wholly in charge of it because a lot of times even with zoom recordings people forget to record you know the forgetting to record is the the number one reason why recordings fail <laughs> sounds <laughs> ironic but it's true <laughs> yeah. you can quote me on that um and so to, a way to alleviate that that is they'll just let the zoom record all day so now i've got this many, many gigabyte file that I have to sit and chop through. And there's so much before oh, and after crazy. talk on these oh. digital platforms. So it's like, I don't know when this thing's starting. And also, so doesn't, doesn't Zoom uh, break that up? They only let you record a certain amount continuously before they, they close your meeting? I don't know. Even if it's six no, hours. Only if, no, only if there's no activity. Uh, oh, inactivity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that would be but, good because then it'd be more files and be shorter. <laughs> well, only if they remember to record once they come back. Like, right. you, yeah. Yes. But also Zoom is particularly annoying because you'll get like, I don't know, eight download files per recording. So it's like, well, what's the real thing? So it took me a while to start figuring out, oh, this is the file I want, but it's, that's its own headache. But just in general, I think if, if, if the same approach that I use is taken where you try to get a clean start stop. And I've seen events do this where they've got a moderator in every room. So they'll make sure to start the recording and stop the recording. You then now have discrete files that you can use. So that's smaller files to work with are just always better because less time to load, less time to process. But also there, like there's this online service that I was gonna start using to train people. It's called Descript. And I've got a link in the show notes. But what it does is it will, when you upload the video, it will transcribe, auto transcribe the video. And then by deleting text, it's trimming the video. So if you delete, mm -hmm. if you look for the, okay, let's get started or whatever, delete all the text before that, you've just trimmed the video, which I'm gonna, that's I'm faster gonna, than I could do it. Try that for the, yeah, I might have to try that for the show. I mean, yeah, you can, it, it'll, you can ask it to delete all the ums and all the pauses. Like it's got some mm -hmm. really clever things built into it. Um, Does it do and text it's, cross talk? I don't know. I only looked into it for a little bit. Also hat, hat tip to April Sides. She's the one who I learned about it through her via Twitter, I think. Um, okay, I'll have to test hat, it out. Yeah, I did a couple tests for it. Haven't actually used it, um, but you can upload. The issue is you have to download your video from a service or if you have it from a live event, you then have to upload it to their service to process it, but then you can publish right from their service to YouTube. So at least, because okay. when I first did it, I thought I had to then also download and then re-upload them. Like it's too much bandwidth going on. But uh, hmm. when I did ask them like, here, here'd be a good feature. They're like, oh yeah, we can do it. Here's, here's where it is. I'm like, swell. Um, hmm. But and it it is a paid service, but I think it's like it's it's definitely not expensive. I think for thirty hours of transcripts per month, it's twenty four dollars per editor, okay. which from an initiative level, that's probably I don't know. I'd have to do the math, but I it's probably within enough. Or like if if um, if maybe not. If you think if you. Yeah, if you have more than one camp a month, you're you're going to go over thirty hours of content. Yeah, for, I mean, even our camp five, we have twenty one hour long sessions, so that's twenty one hours for a one day camp of recording. So you would you would easily exceed that if you have more than one, especially yeah. if people are doing these eight hour. <laughs> eight well, hour yeah, that would that would, that, that would destroy it. Dead time. Uh huh. 
yeah yeah that's why this would only work but, if you're doing discrete um but but this yeah. was like i don't need this for me personally but ultimately like one of my hurdles in in onboarding people and offloading or just bringing new people in is like that the only real skill in my opinion is the video editing everything else is just plug stuff in troubleshoot you'll learn all the tips and tricks even though they're all written down um now you've got this video file what do you do with it i happen to have yeah. light video editing experience most people don't um and the tools like I, I know there's open source tools there's online tools i've not used them so i don't know how to help people so this seemed like an easy any a very easy way to to start someone at hmm. editing have you ever I'm assuming not because you have you have video editing experience, but have you ever used the video editor in YouTube? They got rid of that. No, no, they still they still have Do it. Do they have it? Yeah. Because I, I remember being able to because we did this one mid camp where you could trim videos, you could put yep. them together. For a while they got rid of it. So they must have brought it back. Yeah, it's 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 in there. I use it for the Drupal Providence uh videos because there's and it's, it's like light editing. Like I'm not doing yep. any super advanced stuff, but there's like always a gap between where like the intro slides and the presenter slides are, or like a gap between like this past, this past, um, Drupal Providence, we had three different presenters. So there was a gap. So it was good for trimming those out, um, and, and just kind of cleaning things up a little bit. So, uh, you know, I think, you know, that's interesting. I was interested if you had any experience or any tips or tricks around that. Not really. I do know that YouTube takes a ridiculously long time to process videos. So the, it's one of those things where you like put it in there and then you go get lunch and come back and maybe it's done. Yeah, not, not, not for me. I've got a, I've got, I've got a limit because I, they even started capping how much you could upload in a day that was new and that made me Interesting. sad because usually i'll hmm. at the end of the day i'll throw all my videos at the internet go to sleep wake up and then start adding in all the metadata and then to wake up and find out like oh you only eight out, eight out of 24 are up it's like no that's a bummer right oh, that, yeah. yeah so that's, that's bad. thank you for joining us kevin for the last few weeks it's been great having you as a guest host uh, thanks for having me uh, if our listeners or camp organizers wanted to get in touch and get involved with the session recording initiative, either, you know, maybe, maybe helping on the back end or being one of those point people, what would be the best way for them to get involved? Um, I generally still say Twitter, Kevin J. Thal on Twitter. Um, but if you Google Drupal, set, Drupal recording initiative, you'll find it. I've got links in the show notes. I'm in Drupal Slack. I'm in the Drupal camp organizer Slack. Um, almost anybody who's involved in events knows how to get a hold of me. So um, just hit me any way that you can find me. Sounds good. Do you have questions or feedback? Reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and Chad's book corner, sign up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. You can promote your Drupal camp on Talking Drupal. You can learn more about this at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support's greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and clicking the become a patron button in the sidebar. Again, thank you, Kevin, for joining us. It's been a pleasure, a great topic. And, and thank you for starting the Drupal session recording initiative. It, it's definitely been a huge benefit for the community. If our listeners want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, you can reach me at Kevin J. Thull on Twitter. And John, how can our listeners get in touch with you? You can find me on all the social networks and Drupal.org at John Picozzi. And you can find out about EPAM at epam.com. And you can reach me at NixVan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N, pretty much everywhere. If you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. 
Have a good one, everybody. See you guys next week.